That's good crap. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get underway, if we could, please. Um, I'm Bill Shambra, director of the Bradley Center for Philanthropy and Civic Renewal here at Hudson Institute. Uh, Kristen McIntyre and I welcome you to today's panel discussion entitled Civil Society and the Future of Conservatism. A special welcome uh, to those of you viewing this from the comfort of your homes and offices over live stream or Ustream. I can never, one of those internet, you know, fancy social media services. Anyway, welcome to you as well. Uh, as the Bradley Center's uh, many faithful followers know, uh, in our monthly panels, we try very hard to put aside whatever our own political inclinations may be in order to bring you discussions that are not only lively and thoughtful, uh, but also scrupulously balanced. Ideally, you could watch our panels and not be able to fit us uh, into a well-defined ideological cubbyhole. Uh, but there is no escaping one bias that we have here at the center inscribed in our very name, uh, our determination to help American civil society survive and flourish. Uh, but we were struck in the course of the presidential election of 2012 how infrequently that topic arose. Uh, this absence uh, was particularly evident and particularly surprising in the discourse of the Republican Party, which theoretically considers a healthy civil society uh, the primary alternative to an overbearing central government and the solution of our nation's problems. Republican candidates in the past have managed to talk about civil society uh, and to try, however clumsily, to promote it once in office. We recall President Reagan's private sector initiatives. Uh, President George H.W. Bush's Thousand Points of Light uh, and President George W. Bush's Faith-Based Initiatives. Over that period, we don't recall much by way of civil society discourse from the Dole, McCain, and Romney campaigns, and do note that we also never have occasion to refer to them as president. Uh, <laughs> but an alarm about this conspicuously missing thematic piece and the electoral damage it might cause was sounded in a couple of major essays in both of America's <coughs> uh, leading conservative journals during the election, the Weekly Standard and National Review. Uh, both were written by a commentator, uh, a young commentator, described a couple of weeks ago by David Brooks in the New York Times as one of the right's two or three most influential young writers. We thought those two essays, plus several others, uh, we're good candidates for assigned reading for this panel today as we tackle this question. What, if any, is the role of civil society in the future of conservatism? And we're pleased to have with us this afternoon the author uh, of the essays just mentioned, Yuval Levin, editor of National Affairs magazine. Uh, we'll hear first from him and then we'll proceed to Harry Boyt, uh, director of Augsburg College's Center for Democracy and Citizenship and one of the leading theorists of progressivism's <coughs> version of the civil society argument, although he will take issue with that momentarily. Uh, those of you who have read Stanley Kurtz's uh, book, Radical in Chief, his treatment of President Obama's intellectual development, will recognize Harry as one of the key figures in that development, uh, helping the young Barack Obama to understand that he could best promote his fervent socialism under the guise of community organizing. Uh, Stanley came to this insight during one of the, these uh, panel discussions here at the Bradley Center featuring uh, Katz and Boyd, uh, so the center is proud of its role in helping to expose the red menace. Uh, th then we'll hear from Jimmy Kemp, president of the Jack Kemp Foundation, uh, Jack Kemp being one of the few conservative public figures uh, in the recent past who understood the importance of civil society. Finally, we'll hear from Bob Woodson, founder and president of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. And uh, forgive me, Bob, the grand old man of conservatism's civil society argument. I should note that uh, both Jimmy Kemp and Bob Woodson were present at and provided advice for 
one of the very few campaign speeches from 2012 that did, in fact, address the importance of civil society, uh, namely Congressman Paul Ryan's uh, speech at Cleveland State University in late October, a speech with suspicious echoes uh, of the Levin argument. Anyway, so, Yuval. Thanks very much, Bill, uh, and thank all of you for being here. It's a, it's a tremendous privilege for me to be on the panel with these folks, and it's humbling, too. I'm uh, a relative newcomer to this work, which all of you in various ways have been advancing for such a long time, and which so many people in this room have. Uh, I'm, I'm certain there's not much I can say that you couldn't say better, uh, and so I guess I'm grateful to have been asked to speak first, just so that that's not too obvious. What I thought I would do is talk about why the experience of this past campaign year has left me thinking that this set of issues is more critical than ever, uh, both for meeting the needs of the neediest Americans uh, and helping address some of the enormous social problems that we confront, and for reinforcing the strengths and addressing some of the weaknesses of American conservatism at this moment in time. I should say, to begin with, our subject this afternoon is civil society and conservatism, and that's mostly what I'll take up. But obviously that should not be mistaken for suggesting that civil society somehow belongs to us conservatives. Uh, it is a passion for many on the left as well as on the right, and more importantly, the left might gain enormously from considering the value and the virtues of, of civil society, as Harry Boyd has shown so ably, and I'm sure will again. But I do think that a focus on civil society can provide enormous benefit uh, to the right today because it would help to remind us of what the conservative vision of society has been all about, what we are for, not just what we're against. It would help us speak to groups of fellow citizens and voters that we've had some trouble with lately. It's a necessary complement to any effort to reduce the role and size of government and social policy. And most importantly, it offers some hope that the disastrous social breakdown that afflicts so many poor communities in our country might actually be eased or reversed to some degree in the only way in which it possibly could be, which is one community at a time, one person at a time, directly, face to face. The question of civil society presented itself with particular force in this campaign year because that question, or really the glaring absence of that question, was powerfully evident in so much of what was said by both parties during the presidential race. On the face of it, this was supposed to be an election about the president's economic stewardship. But over and over, in almost despite themselves, the two parties were constantly drawn into a deeper argument about what really ought to matter most in American life. Each party was drawn into that argument by a strongly held criticism of what it took to be the other party's understanding of our society. Democrats complained that Republicans were radical individualists who imagined that successful people got to be successful all by themselves and owe nothing at all to the larger society. They equated Republican hostility to the growth of government with hostility to common action and mutual interdependence in general. And that was in part because they far too easily equated common action with government action in their own thinking and, and rhetoric. When the president spoke of things we do together, he talked almost exclusively about public works projects and federal investments in various mm -hmm. things. Others made this point even more explicit. At the Democratic Convention, Barney Frank, for instance, said, Quote, there are things that a civilized society needs that we can only do when we do them together. And when we do them together, that's called government, end quote. <laughs> so presumably Republicans don't believe in government because they don't believe in doing things together in this line of thinking. Meanwhile, Republicans, largely in response to this line of thinking, committed something like the equal and opposite error. They criticized the Democrats for advancing what Mitt Romney called a government-centered society and for denying the importance of individual success and drive in response to the president's assertion that business owners didn't really build what they have, Republicans mostly assured those business owners that they did build that. And in moments of particular candor, including moments they didn't realize were being recorded, Republicans also expressed concern about how that government-centered society would undermine self-reliance by creating dependency. Again and again, Republicans accused Democrats of ignoring individual achievement and overvaluing government achievements and Democrats accused Republicans of ignoring government achievements and overvaluing individual achievements. This made for some interesting arguments, but it was, it was also notable for what it took for granted, and therefore what it missed. To see our fundamental political divisions as a tug of war between the government and the individual is to accept the premise that individuals and the state are all there is to society. 
that these are our options. The premise of conservatism has always been, on the contrary, that what matters most about society happens in the space between those two, and that creating, sustaining, and protecting that space is one of the key purposes of government. That space between the individual and the state is filled not only with civil society institutions, it's also home to the family, to the private economy, but in our society in particular, it stands out especially for the extraordinary array of groups of citizens brought together by common beliefs or priorities and moved by the desire to improve our common life, working towards social purposes. This is the vast array of associations that Alexis de Tocqueville encountered to his constant amazement in America. As he put it, where in France you would find a government official at the head of a project for social improvement, and where in Britain you would find a wealthy benefactor at its head, in America you would find an association of citizens. To ignore what happens in the space between the individual and the state, especially to ignore the mediating institutions of civil society, is therefore to ignore the heart and soul of American life. And that's more or less what the arguments that filled this presidential campaign year did. It's a little easier to see how the left might do this than the right, since among some American progressives there's always been an inclination to want to rationalize civil society out of existence. Some progressives in America have always viewed the mediating institutions with suspicion, seeing them as instruments of division or prejudice or selfishness, and seeking to empower the government to make the life of our society more rational by clearing away those vestiges of backwardness and putting in their place public programs and policies motivated by a single cohesive understanding of the public interest. The idea is to level the complex social topography of the space between individuals and the government, to break up tightly knit clusters of citizens into individuals and then unite all those individuals under the national banner, allowing them to be free of the oppressive authority of family or community norms while building solidarity through the common experience of living as equal citizens of a great nation. This would make people both more secure and more free. Dependence on people you know is oppressive, the progressive suggested, because it always comes with moral and social strings. But dependence on larger and more generic and distant systems of benefits and rules can be liberating. It frees people from the moral sway of traditional social institutions, even as it frees them from material want. A healthy dose of moral individualism combined with a healthy dose of economic collectivism make for a powerful mix of freedom and equality. Conservatives have always resisted that kind of rationalization of society and insisted that local knowledge channeled by evolving social institutions, from civic and fraternal groups to traditional religious establishments to charitable enterprises and even in some respects complex economic markets, will make for better material outcomes and a better common life. Moral individualism mixed with economic collectivism only feels like freedom because it liberates people from responsibility in both arenas. But real freedom is only possible with real responsibility. And real responsibility is only possible when you depend upon and are depended upon by people you know. It is, in other words, only possible in precisely that space between the individual and the state that too many on the left have sought to collapse. To permit the national debate to devolve into an argument between those who value individual accomplishment and those who value public action is therefore to give up the game in advance, at least as far as conservatives are concerned. It is to accept as a premise a vision of society that denies some key conservative assumptions. That social problems are almost always first and foremost moral problems. That moral problems are best addressed through direct face-to-face, hand-to-hand contact rather than the cold and neutral transfer of resources. That local knowledge embodied in community and civic associations often contains a lot more practical wisdom than a technocratic national program could hope to attain. And that society is strengthened rather than weakened by the lawful chaos of different people pushing in different directions and trying different things at the same time. I think it's worth noting that a basic distaste for that diversity of purposes is at the heart of a lot of the progressive distaste for civil society. It seems to be driven by a desire that society be moved by a common notion of the common good and not pulled in countless directions all at once. An understandable desire, but it presents itself in the form of an intolerance of nonconformity. This year gave us a powerful example of where that kind of intolerance points in the Department of Health and Human Services rule requiring religious employers to provide free abortive and contraceptive drugs to their employees under the health care law. There's a lot that I've disagreed with in what this administration has done in various arenas, but to my mind that rule and the very idea that it could be done, that it could be proposed, is easily the most troubling development of the past four years. 
and precisely for what it says about the government's attitude toward civil society. The HHS rule did not assert that people should have the freedom to use such drugs as they wanted, which of course they do have. It didn't even say that the government should facilitate people's access to them, which it does and has for a long time. Rather, it required that the Catholic Church and other religious entities should themselves facilitate people's access to them, despite their religious convictions. It aimed to turn the institutions of civil society into active agents of the government's ends, regardless of their own ends and concerns. It implicitly asserted that our nation will not tolerate an institution that is unwilling to actively ratify the views of the people in power, that we will not let it be and find other ways to put those views into effect. An extraordinarily radical assertion of government power and a failure, I think, of even basic toleration. The rule most likely will be reversed in court, but the fact that it was attempted at all should worry us about the attitude of our government toward civil society and the mediating institution. But that worry should raise a question. What should that attitude be? It's not an obvious question. And here I think conservatives have some real thinking to do. The fact, the fact is that our approach to that question is today much too defensive. In this arena, as in too many others, we have a much clearer sense of what government shouldn't do than of what it should do. We know that government should not try to invade the space taken up by our civil society institutions. We have a general sense, too, that it should seek to help those institutions do their own work where it can. It's vital for conservatives to stress this point because a political movement that wants to restrain the role of government in providing social services needs to be able to offer the public a concrete and plausible alternative, a different path to meeting the needs of the vulnerable and the poor. We've seen for half a century that the approach of the Great Society Welfare State to meeting those needs tends in many important respects to exacerbate the problems it's trying to solve, often because it refuses to see those problems as fundamentally cultural and moral problems that require a restoration of community and family structure. And by failing to see that, the government has tended to further weaken the communities and families of America's most vulnerable people. But seeing that is not in itself a solution. Civil society does need space to thrive, and the state should guard and sustain that space. But civil society needs more than space to thrive, especially today. It needs a revival, a renewal, which in turn would need to drive a broader cultural renewal. And that presents a more complicated challenge for conservatives thinking about public policy. If we accept the importance of civil society, then we have to recognize that a revival of civil society today would require more than government getting out of the way. And the question of what the nature of that more ought to be should be on the minds of conservatives far more than it is. I don't have the answer to that question, and part of the appeal of this gathering today for me is that it puts me in the company of people much better suited to offer guidance. And we do have some past examples of both success and failure to draw. In thinking about civil society, conservatives should take comfort from the fact that, in conservative fashion, this is not the first time that we've had to do this. From the intellectual heavy lifting of Robert Nisbet and his successors in the middle of the last century, to the deeply thoughtful efforts of Richard John Newhouse and Peter Berger in the Mediating Structures Project in the late 70s, to Jack Kemp's heroic political efforts on behalf of empowerment, to the Bradley Foundation's groundbreaking work in the 90s and through compassionate conservatism, the question of how to turn conservatism's concern for civil society into practical projects that help the least among us has been much considered and debated on the right. The history of that conversation does not yield in a simple conclusion, as no serious intellectual effort could, but it does suggest that an emphasis on civil society can be immensely helpful to conservatism, both as a matter of political messaging and, much more importantly, as a counterweight to the excesses of a purely market-oriented conservatism and as the organizing principle of a vision of society that is finally what conservatism is all about. How it translates into practical policy and day-to-day -day work, however, is a subject which I'm probably the least well-qualified person on this panel to address. So I'll gladly leave it to my fellow, fellow panelists and take careful notes. Thanks. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted that Bill Schomber organized an event four years after the last one. Um, and I want to suggest another way 
to describe the theme today. Civil society and the meaning of democracy. I pick up on the discussion four years ago, which Bill <laughs> referred to. In the middle of the 2008 campaign, I'm glad you had this conversation after that. So much better time for this conversation. In that forum, um, Barack Obama is a community organizer. I argued that the politics that had schooled him in Chicago as a young organizer for the Gamaliel Foundation was what in the language of organizing is called organizing politics. And it differs from the politics that dominates today in both civic and electoral campaign, which is mobilizing politics. ACORN's a good example of mobilizing politics, but it's everywhere. Mobilizing politics has become highly sophisticated. Its roots are deep in the 20th century in mass politics on the left. In the 70s, it crystallized in the techniques like the door-to-door -door canvas using a formula. The part of mobilizing politics is to divide the world into a Manichaean battle between the forces of righteousness and the damned. And that is print. And modern telecommunication speeds the process. It promotes the profoundly dysfunctional fantasy that we will be fine if we can get rid of the evil half. Organizing, by way of contrast, develops people's capacities to self-organize and to work together across differences. In the mainstream, Oh, okay. In the in the general public discussion, I would say David Brooks, uh, although focused almost singularly on the formal political process, is an articulate and often deeply insightful critic of mobilizing Manichaean approaches, including the column he had this morning in the New York Times. Today, I want to argue <coughs> that we need a different kind of politics that doesn't demonize, doesn't divide the world into the forces of, forces of the righteous and the damned, <clears throat> that points beyond elections. A people's politics, a populist politics, <clears throat> that defines citizens as the foundational agents of democracy and of change. Democracy, in these terms, is best understood in a Tocquevillian sense as a society, not simply or mainly as a system of elections. <clears throat> and we are all involved in the work of building it everywhere. We need to see such politics on a large scale. That's my argument today. <clears throat> and I would simply contrast the thinness of contemporary discussions about tax rates and budgets as relevant as they are to the uh, enumeration of the challenges facing humanity by Pope John Paul II in his great encyclical in 1995 on human life. A brilliant piece of work. I don't agree with his approach to criminalizing abortion, but I think he had brilliant insights. <clears throat> and one simple listing Whatever insults human dignity, such as subhuman living conditions, arbitrary imprisonment, deportation, slavery, prostitution, the selling of women and children, as well as disgraceful working conditions where people are treated as mere instruments of gain rather than as free pe persons, all these things and others like them are infamies. They poison human societies. They do more harm to those who practice them than who those who suffer from the injuries. They are a supreme dishonor to the Creator. And John Paul in that encyclical goes on to say that this culture of devaluation of the human uh, person is increasingly characteristic of the modern age and modern technologies and discoveries can easily feed it. He talks about a culture of efficiency, a uprootedness of the human condition, the spread of the consumer society, which I was reminded of when I saw the hordes of people shopping this last weekend as if in a rock concert. So how are we going to deal with this? These enormous problems. 
that can't be solved by dividing the world into the evildoers and the righteous and hoping to get rid of one half. It can't happen that way. <clears throat> I want to argue that Yuval and other conservatives call for attention to civic, civil society have much to contribute. Institutions of faith, family, ethnicity, voluntary group are crucial to building a decent society. And they need not only defense, but they need reconstruction. There are other deep insights from conservative thinkers. I would say the critique of technocracy has been much more trenchant and penetrating on conservative side than on the left side. And I would say <coughs> um, the sense of the uh, sacredness of the person is, is more developed and uh, especially central to our work the concept of work itself, human labor that creates and co-creates the world is central to a decent society. The dignity, the purposes, the natures of, of labor, I argued in the piece that Bill sent out that the civic dimensions of labor have largely disappeared from the uh, conservative vocabulary, which is a tragedy, but it's the concept of work has largely disappeared from the democratic vision. But I think there's something missing on the conservative side, and that is attention to power. We need not only responsible citizens, caring citizens, we need powerful citizens. We need citizens who see themselves as productive, as builders of the world, not simply consumers of the world. And an alternative citizen politics like this, productive labor, of creating things and building things of common value has been at the very heart of the American democratic experience. Warts and all, not to romanticize the American story. But it has been the democratic genius of America. David Matthews, president of the Kettering Foundation, gets at it when he describes, this was a sweaty, hands-on, problem-solving politics. The democracy of self-rule was rooted in collective decision-making and act especially acting. Settlers had to be producers, not simply consumers. They joined forces to build forts, roads, and libraries. They established the first public schools. Their efforts were examples of public work, meaning work done not just for the public, but by the public. I learned about the concept of populism and more broadly this concept of a different kind of politics in the civil rights movement, which we called on the ground the freedom movement. Delighted that Gerald Taylor, a great young leader in the freedom movement uh, several decades ago, is here with us today. And Bob Woodson was also a major figure in the civil rights movement. I worked in the citizenship education program of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The movement was a great moral crusade against segregation, but it also taught on the ground a different kind of politics in the citizenship schools that I participated in. My dad was on the executive committee, so I was a lowly college student, a field secretary, but I was shaped by that experience. In the new book by Dorothy Cotton, If Your Back's Not Bent, from Simon & Schuster, she tells the story of the citizenship education program and the thousands of people who went to George Chester to went, go back to their communities and create citizenship schools across the South. She talks about the practical, problem-solving politics that ordinary people learned in the citizenship classes across the South which transformed identities from victims to agents of change and first-class citizens. We need that again today in the 21st century on a large scale. I have considerable sympathy for Yuval's critique of the 2012 elections for the sliding of the role of civil society. I do want to note that President Obama talked in both his acceptance speech and his victory speech about citizenship and the work of self-governance. Mainly, I want to emphasize that it's not up to the president to revitalize civic life and civil society. To talk about the challenges today, I want to highlight another figure forgotten largely today in the public conversation. Saul Alinsky, as in Stanley Kurtz's book, gets the credit and the blame for birthing community organizing and educating the young Obama, but it was Gino Baroni, in my view, who was much more important in the history of community organizing and a much more significant voice for today's politics. So let me briefly conclude with talking about the legacy of Gino Baroni. 
Burundi was passionately concerned about bridging the divide between blacks and white ethnics, the kinds of people who often vote for Rick Santorum today. This is personal to me because Martin Luther King assigned me to organize southern mill workers and community organizing. I did that for seven years in Durham from 66 to 72. Baroni came from an Italian-American coal mining family in Pennsylvania, became a Catholic priest in 1956, served in a couple of coal mining regions, and then uh, took an inner city parish in Washington, D.C., where he became a major figure in the Catholic Church's involvement in the civil rights movement. He was the liaison to the March on Washington in 1970, 1963, and he led the Catholic delegation to the March from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. In the late 1960s, there developed in America an increasing divide which alarmed Gino Baroni. He saw on the one hand uh, what he called universalist liberalism, uh, for whom the term white ethnic was a term of contempt. And he thought the focus on redistributive justice delivered through the government and focus on rights was the wrong agenda for those concerned about justice and more broadly about human progress and development. He also disagreed with the neoconservative turn that saw the solution as a kind of hunkering down and a bashing of the liberals. He thought there needed to be a different politics and he called that the new populism. This is what Baroni said was his vision. The organizer has to believe that ordinary people can build bridges across racial and ethnic lines. The organizer has to get ordinary people in touch with their roots, their heritage, their best. I want to come back to this in the discussion. The organizer has to give ordinary people hope. Baroni was an extraordinarily important figure in community organizing. He was, along with Father uh, John Egan, was the architect of the Campaign for Human Development, which continues to be the major funding arm for groups that empower the poor. Uh, Baroni uh, was the architect of the National Commission on Neighborhoods, uh, the driving force behind the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which uh, made public the lending practices of banks, an enormous resource for poor communities and minority communities. I could go on and on, but I want to conclude with three ways it seems to me that uh, Gino Baroni's populism is prophetic and relevant to our time. First of all, his populism weds citizen empowerment, citizen responsibility, and the productive identities developed through what we call public work. Public work is collective effort that <coughs> solves problems and builds common resources. It is different than consumer politics of what can we get. And interestingly, in Barack Obama's history, you see an attentiveness to the problem with community organizing groups which have a simply consumerist framework. In 1988 essay in a book called Beyond Alinsky in, in Illinois uh, challenges the co community organizing world for having a kind of consumerist view of the person. But Baroni developed this much more detail. In fact, Baroni believing that every culture in America has tremendous democratic resources and potentials and the task of organizing is to bring them out, gave many, many speeches like uh, Barack Obama's race speech in Philadelphia during the 2008 campaign. <coughs> <coughs> Populism in Baroni's terms is not anti-government. Government is a space and a meeting ground and a resource that needs to be reclaimed. Secondly, Gino Baroni believed in the mediating structures of civil society, which Levin and others championed. Congregations, families, ethnic groups, neighborhood groups. He would have agreed that we need civic reconstruction, not simply defense. We need a broad movement to reconstruct the foundations of civil society. But here's a difference that Baroni has, would have had with contemporary conservatives that I share. He saw these not simply as sources of virtue or refuges, havens in a heartless world in Christopher Lash's terms. He saw mediating institutions as centers of power, independent power. 
multiplications of independent power were the very foundation of democracy. And this was not simply defense against concentrations of power. It was that, whether in giant economic or governmental institutions. It was also the power to act constructively on the problems that face communities. So I'm sure Bob Woodson will talk about this. And letter, local centers of power in these terms can include not only um, congregations, but they can include small businesses and union locals and schools that are grounded in the life of the community. Interestingly, Hubert Humphrey's whole life career was built around this vision. In 1952, he argued that the purpose of small business is not low-cost goods, but citizens who have the confidence to stand up to government and anybody else. Do we want an economy where there are thousands upon thousands of small entrepreneurs, independent businesses, and landholders who can stand on their feet and talk back to anybody? Humphrey derived from this sense of independent power the, the belief, the conviction that uh, uh, America uh, was populist in its very constitution. He, he called himself a populist enshrined in the we the people the notion that the gov that the people create government to be our instrument uh, this point that small property by the way is a foundation of democracy and small in uh, various centers of power um, is a central theme in a collection I edited for the Good Society Gerald Taylor has a great piece on um, on small property as its centrality in black populism and the black freedom struggle it, I think the table of contents is over there along with the brief description of Baroni. Finally, Gino Baroni believed that politics, populist politics, a people's politics, a nonpartisan, cross-partisan, practical politics that's democratizing power could be practiced anywhere and needs to be practiced everywhere. And Baroni's own life was a <coughs> reflection of that. He organized in communities. He created the National Center for Urban Ethnic Affairs and organized with hundreds of ethnic groups across America. Under the Carter administration, he went into HUD, Housing and Urban Development, as the Assistant Secretary and created the Office of Neighborhood Self-Help and used that office as a foundation to rework government categorical grants in just the ways you've all you're talking about how to become resources for citizen initiative and citizen self-help and citizen organizing. So there's a tremendously rich legacy about policy and transformation within government itself. Of course, Bill Schumber tried to do this also in the first Bush administration in, in Health and Human Services. I want to just conclude by saying we have followed in this tradition in our own work. We've believed that populist organizing, cross-partisan politics of <coughs> empowerment needs to be practiced not only in community groups, but has to be practiced everywhere. We have especially focused on the challenges of education, working to revive and create uh, schools and settlement houses and colleges that are grounded in the life of communities, that push back against the detachment of professional systems from civil civic culture. And that's a pattern that uh, we see as uh, very central to the problems we face in our world today. Uh, our work over the years also involves something called public achievement, which is in a number of countries. I want to express appreciation to Bill Schomber and the Bradley Foundation for supporting public achievement. So public achievement is a youth initiative in which young people develop skills and identities of productive citizenship through doing what we call public work projects. In the strongest of cases, helping to transform schools and community groups into centers of power in the life of communities. There are remarkable stories that uh, perhaps we can talk about in, uh, in the question and answer. But uh, our work led the White House Office of Public Engagement to invite me in 2011 to create a coalition of colleges and universities and educational associations to promote the idea of higher education as a public good, not simply a private benefit. And we've continued to work with that. Um, we see a receptivity in a time of enormous crisis to the idea that we need to renew things like the old land-grant tradition of democracy colleges, colleges which are rooted in the life of places that work in the, that are part of places, not partners with places, and that have central concern with educating citizenship. So I would say we need a citizen-centered democracy that includes but goes beyond civil society for a successful future, and to build such a democracy, we need populist politics.
that goes well beyond the spectacle that we see today that masquerades in politics. Well, like the other panelists, uh, it's a privilege to be here. My name is Jimmy Kemp. I'm president of the Jack Kemp Foundation. Um, and yeah, I, I haven't studied these issues as, uh, and worked in them as long as these gentlemen have or as, uh, uh, with as much focus as they have. Um, but what you and I know together and what my father was able to demonstrate through his political career is that we won't make any progress in this nation unless, unless this is a nation that has vision. Um, and we've got to have leaders uh, with vision. Um, so many people come up to me. I, I work here in D.C., live in northwest D.C., um, in you know, pretty much a, a, a liberal neighborhood. Um, and it's incredibly gratifying whenever I go places and people find out that I'm my father's son, uh, they say, oh, mostly in Northwest DC. Oh, he's a Republican I could stand. I, I like Jack <laughs> Kemp. <laughs> um, and it's, it's fascinating now running the foundation and uh, having worked with my father for from 2002 uh, after my football career, um, I played in Canada. I, I've got to tell a quick aside. Uh, <laughs> I grew up the son, not of a congressman. I was born in 1971. My father was uh, elected in 1970 from Buffalo, New York. I was born in 71. And in elementary school, you all know how I introduced myself. I was the son of quarterback Jack Kemp, not congressman Jack Kemp. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it worked pretty well for me. Um, and then my brother went on to, uh, my brother Jeff is 12 years older than I am um, and works with an organization called Family Life down in Little Rock, Arkansas. And Jeff's life passion is now focusing on marriage, which I think is one of the key components uh, to building a civil society. But Jeff, before he uh, discovered this calling, he was an NFL football player for 11 years. Um, so I was the son of an NFL quarterback, the brother of an NFL quarterback, <laughs> And I thought that I was going to be an NFL quarterback. Lo and behold, after my Wake Forest career, um, I, uh, I got a call from the Canadian Football League and ended up playing eight years there. Um, but my, my future wife and I met, she was a reporter, and she had to interview me. And I was a rookie for a United States football team in the Canadian Football League, the Sacramento Gold Miners. And she interviewed me, and she said, now, they tell me that your dad was an NFL quarterback and a politician, and your brother was an NFL quarterback. Let me get this straight. Your fourth string quarterback on a Canadian football league team in Sacramento, California. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and this story actually relates to what we're here talking about. My answer to her was that I believe God has a plan for my life. And yes, I was fourth string quarterback, um, but I knew that if I worked hard enough, uh, that I could earn my way. If I wasn't good enough, they'd cut me. Um, it didn't matter that my dad had played. It didn't matter that my brother had played. I'm sure that helped get the door open. But I, I had to perform once I was on the field. Um, and that was ingrained in me uh, from my father. Um, every day we'd go out the door uh, of the house, and dad would, if he was sitting in his chair, uh, Bob probably remembers the chair. My mom still lives in the same house. He'd be sitting in that chair, and you'd walk out of the house, and he'd say, hey, be a leader. Um, and what our country needs are visionaries, leaders, people who care. And uh, one of the key reasons my father was so successful, and part of the reason why I am called to run the Jack Kemp Foundation, is because I know a secret behind my dad's success. Uh, <coughs> many of you who know my parents know it as well, but it's also the key to success in this country. My mom understood the power of the personal. And anytime my mom and dad went somewhere, dad would, you know, he'd do his thing. 
but my mom would ask questions of people. She'd find out what's going on in their lives. And what I've heard and what we all innately know is that if we end up living in a country where the power of the personal is taken away from families and people and placed in the hands of government, that's a dangerous position. And you don't have to be uh, a Democrat or a Republican to understand that. We live in a liberal, small l, liberal, free society. Um, and the great privilege I have is to uh, try to help remind people the reason so many loved my dad was that he was able, with my mom's significant help, to identify the power of the personal as that distinctive American trait that here, more than in any other country, doesn't mean it couldn't happen in other countries or can't happen in other countries, but here, the power of the personal, the power of your willingness to work, whether it's football or uh, economics or teaching, whatever it is, you can achieve what you can here in this country. That's why people want to come here. Um, one of the other key components is an understanding of the dynamic nature of life. And uh, Harry, when you were talking about the, uh, <coughs> the righteous and the damned, we all have to have an understanding that we are all the damned and none of us are looking down upon others as we are righteous and they are the damned. That's the whole premise behind the power of the personal that my mom preached so well and hopefully I learned from is that you treat people with respect and you approach them with humility and you find out about their stories. And once you do, then it unleashes the possibility for whatever that relationship can possibly be. Um, this coming Tuesday night, so a week from tonight, uh, the Kemp Foundation is uh, hosting our second Kemp Leadership Award dinner. Um, and our, part of our goal, well, our mission at the foundation is to develop, recognize, and, ex and uh, <coughs> engage exceptional leaders who champion the American idea. Um, the Kemp Leadership Award is our effort uh, to recognize exceptional leaders who champion the American idea. And we all know that the American idea is really at its root, the human idea um, that's described in our Declaration of Independence uh, and embodied in the Constitution. Um, and that continues today. Despite however discouraged we are, it continues. The American idea is the human idea, but it's really the divine idea, the, the reality that a creator created us, um, and we are not the creator, but we were created to uh, engage the world, um, to engage others. And so next Tuesday night, um, we're honoring an exceptional leader <laughs> Uh, Senator Marco Rubio, who has an ability to communicate these ideas uh, that is critical to providing the vision for the country. And at the Kemp Foundation, we want to encourage um, politicians of any stripe uh, who have a desire to see the American idea uh, more fully realized. Last year, we honored Paul Ryan um, as our uh, award winner and uh, it was a it was a great evening we had Paul give a speech after Redskins linebacker London Fletcher um, who's he's amazing he, if anybody doesn't like football just pay attention to London Fletcher if you have to watch a Redskins game um, London has played 160 straight games just three games ago he pulled a hamstring had to come out of the game the next week he was back on the field. Um, when I just introduced London, uh, I said, London, it's appropriate we're having you speak here today because we're honoring the middle linebacker of Congress. Um, and that's what Paul Ryan is. He believes the American idea has to be prote protected and he <clears throat> is committed to the vision that he learned uh, in part from my father, when he was uh, working at Empower America uh, with Dad and Bill Bennett and Gene Patrick. Um, but London told the story 
of when he really learned responsibility and accountability and what it means to be a man. And London's answer was when I got married to my wife. It wasn't when I was at, at college. He went to a small Division three school, John Carroll in Cleveland. It wasn't when he was drafted by the, or I think he was a free agent acquisition by the St. Louis Rams, but then he was traded to the Redskins. But London said, marrying my wife is what turned me into a man. And in this country, civil society, that place between individuals and government, um, we've got to have community organizations that actually do the work at the grassroots level um, that make a difference in people's lives, that deliver the power of the personal, um, <clears throat> that really are the channel for uh, our creator to work here on the earth, um, to be the hands and feet. So we certainly need vision, um, but uh, I'm privileged to be working and learning, uh, working with and learning from Bob Woodson. Um, just the other week, he, he sent me out and said, Jimmy, here, I've got a, uh, some research for you to do. And uh, so he sent me over to Northeast DC and I had the opportunity to learn what a homecomer is. I don't know if any of you know what a homecomer is, but a homecomer is an ex-convict who has come home and wants to get reintegrated into society, who recognizes that he or she was a part of the problem, but now wants to be a part of the solution. Um, and, and then he sent me out to, uh, what is it, Hope Village? House of Help. House of Help. House of Help. Um, City of Hope. City of Hope. I knew it had hope. <laughs> Thank you, Colette. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Dr. Shirley Holloway and Curtis Watkins and many of the people who, you know, all of us know, but Bob's introduced me to folks right here in our backyard. <laughs> um, they're, they're the key to unleashing uh, real civil society and getting <clears throat> the American idea realized where it matters lo most um, in our neighborhoods and communities where people have been tempted with that promise of a handout. Um, we certainly need a safety net, but we've got to make sure that the ladder of opportunity exists. And the basis for that is the right economic policies, certainly tax policy, we at the Kemp Foundation care a little bit about tax policy, and you've got to get tax policy right, but you've got to empower people, um, and you, you have to do what Dad did when he was uh, working with Bob from Congress, and make sure that when you find places where the government is actually uh, keeping people as essentially in jail, like public housing projects used to be, you've got to figure out how to unleash that and change it and come up with creative ideas. Um, Kimmy Gray is a name some of you may remember, and Kimmy uh, was a public housing resident who was a part of the tenant management uh, movement and initiative. And public housing was, uh, because of Dad and Bob's work and many others, tenant management became a part of uh, you know, our country's laws. And Kimmy had this to say that I think uh, epitomizes uh, much of what we're talking about when we talk about civil society. Um, so Kenilworth Parkside Courts in D.C. Um, was where Kimmy lived and then became a tenant manager. She said, we used to be accustomed to calling downtown and marching on HUD and cussing everybody out. And then we became downtown. And now we only curse ourselves out. And when pipes burst, we're the first ones there. And we stay up all night until the problem is resolved. What we did was to return respect and pride back to the residents of the community to give them back the responsibility that was rightfully theirs, to maintain the community in which they resided. Um, <clears throat> and that focus of empowerment and looking for places where people have uh, <coughs> lost that empowerment um, is, I think, a, a key mission. You gotta do it block by block, people by people. And so at the Kemp Foundation, while we wanna recognize leaders with vision, we also want to engage community leaders uh, who are making a difference on the ground. Um, and that's uh, part of the reason I'm privileged to be working with Bob. Um, I also want to <clears throat> remind 
everyone that uh, we already know this, but we, my dad was a member of the Republican Party, and he was a <coughs> proud member of the party. Uh, one of the quotes that he always loved um, to use was that we serve our party best by serving our country first. Um, and those are the types of leaders we all say, yes, that's, that's what we were, are looking for in a leader. Um, Dad attributed that quote to Abraham Lincoln, which was incorrect. And I know you're shocked to hear that my father didn't <coughs> quote somebody perfectly. But he, did, he loved Abraham Lincoln. So anything worthwhile saying, he just attributed it to. <laughs> uh, my friend David Vondrelli recently wrote a book about uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and he has Lincoln saying the following. Owning slaves, Lincoln said, was the sign of the gentleman of leisure who was above and scorned labor. But in a healthy society, Lincoln believed nothing was above labor, neither wealth nor aristocracy, nor dictatorial power. The prudent, penniless beginner in the world labors for wages a while, saves a surplus with which to buy tools or land for himself, then labors on his own account another while at and then labors on his own account another while, and at length hires another new beginner to help him. This is the just and generous and prosperous system which opens the way to all, gives hope to all, and consequent energy and progress and improvement of condition to all. No men living are more worthy to be trusted than those who toil up from poverty, or in my case, from the Canadian Football League. These good citizens must never surrender their power. Regardless of political powers or parties, people need to believe again in the system. And this is a great system. It's far from perfect, but this is a great system. And it's a privilege and a calling for me to help remind people of the incredible opportunity we have um, because of the great work that can be done, is being done, um, and uh, I know you all are here because you care similarly, and it should give us all hope. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. And um, it's a privilege to be here. I, I thought I'd lighten it up a little bit with a joke that I think serves as a good preamble to my remarks. And you might have heard it, so just bear with me. But a man was drowning 20 feet from the shore. And a, conserv a liberal came along and saw him drowning and reasoned that it was 20 feet, so he gave him 40 feet of rope, because that's what he had, but failed to tie it to the shore. And then a conservative came along and saw that he was 20 feet from the shore, decided to throw the rope, 10 feet of rope, let him swim the other way. And then a neoconservative came along and saw the man drowning and went home and wrote a column about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, the dilemma we face as we look at what frustrated me most is that neither political party running for office addressed the needs of the least of God's children. Neither one. And the problem that, that, that and I came from a tradition of the civil rights movement, but I recognize that uh, having helped Native Americans take over Alcatraz early in my life, worked a lot with uh, Cesar Chavez and farm workers, and then led demonstrations in uh, Philadelphia and Westchester, Pennsylvania, I had to realize that the reality that the strategic interest of liberals at that time were compatible with the strategic interests of the poor. But any, like any other tax loophole, always starts as a tax incentive. So as strategic interests change, as strategic circumstances evolve, and so as a, a leader of the civil rights movement in the 60s, unfortunately, the civil rights movement over the decades has morphed into a race grievance industry. 
And back in the 60s when the poverty program married, when we were, I was working with Gino Baroni and the others in 1965, the Westminster Association, where government intervened for the first time in the economy on behalf of poor people. And, but when the poor, in, in, the, in the first year of that movement, they really were represented by community organizers and who were indigenous to these communities. But when these community organizers began to challenge the decisions of local politicians, they were, something had to be done. So what the government did was a simple policy change altered the whole course of that movement. They said community outreach workers from now on and forward must be college educated. A simple change changed the whole nature of who delivers services to the poor. And so what we did was government intervened for the first time in the lives of the poor, for, or the second time rather, the first time was with FDR. But the second time they intervened, they, uh, monies by the trillions of dollars were directed to help the poor, but they were translated into services for the poor. So 70% of all the dollars went to a professional class <coughs> of people who were college educated, who were tasked with designing remedies for the poor that were parachuted into their communities with the expectation that the poor uh, uh, participate. And what this did was it meant that the indigenous institutions of those communities were now set against the interests of a provider class of people so that, so that the, 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 the the competition area was not people who are good or evil. It was a professional class of people whose proprietary interest was contingent upon having poor people dependent on government services. So they asked not which problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable this year. And unfortunately, it had a racial component too, since two out of every 10 whites with college education works for government. Unfortunately, six out of 10 blacks who with college education works for government. So it has a racial uh, component. So whether or not a person is compassionate about the poor or care or, or, or promoting self-sufficiency, <coughs> their strategic and economic interests are hostile to the mediating institutions that are indigenous to these communities. And, and, so as a, and so as a consequence, you see this tension that has evolved over the years, and that's what caused me to move to the right of center when I realized that a lot of the people who suffered and sacrificed most in civil rights did not benefit from the change. And so I began to look for other strategic partners, and I found it in conservatism only because they, they do not profit. As my friend John McKnight said, as he was building a cabin in Wisconsin, the electrician was a drunk and the carpenter had one leg. Was his interest in that electrician and the carpenter was their capacity to perform. But if your, your income depends upon the alcoholism of the electrician and the one leg of the carpenter, you don't care about their capacity because your strategic interest is hostile to the strategic interest of the person suffering these maladies. So that's the big dilemma. And so what the center that I have done with my life is go into these neighborhoods and realize, as, as Rachel and Don Warren did, that when you went into low-income neighborhoods and they asked questions of social scientists, very seldom asked, where do low-income people turn to when times of trouble? And their studies reveal that the first institutions that poor people turn to in times of crisis are institutions within their same zip code. They are local uh, churches, uh, lo uh, local ethnic subgroups. The last institution they turn to is a professional service provider. So in light of this reality, we tend to deliver services to the institution of last choice of the poor and wonder why we fail. The Office of Juvenile Justice, for instance, identified 300 programs around the country that were serving juvenile delinquents. They went into those communities in seven cities 
and surveyed people who were serving youth in those communities, these mediating institutions. Less than 5% of the people could even name the organizations who were funded by the billions to serve them, to, as an illustration of the disconnect. Okay, why do people turn to these institutions? I'll give you three quick examples. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, was racked with youth gang violence. 48 uh, gang members were killed a year. They put the Vietnam deaths next to the gang deaths. Traditional social service didn't work. An enterprising woman, Sister Pata, and her husband found out the oldest of their six sons was a gang member and invited them to bring this 15 members home. She cleared out the furniture in the house and brought all these young men. In the course of three years, a hundred gang members from all over the city found a sanctuary in her small uh, neighborhood. They all worked and cooperated, retired the mortgages and expanded to five houses. She then, using them as emissaries in 1973, sent them out throughout the city and organized a citywide gang uh, conference summit and the city closed down the Mummer's Day Parade. They said, anyone who does this is crazy. But the reality was what happened was the city went from 48 gang deaths down to two in one year. And they sustained that. In, 19, uh, in the 80s, uh, Jack Kemp came to our office and said, Bob, you are working with residents of public housing, Ms. Kimmy Gray that Jimmy talked about. Here's a woman abandoned by her husband at age uh, 21 with five children in welfare, got off welfare in three years, and sent all five of her children to college <clears throat> from this one public housing development. And then she inspired the other residents in 10-year period. She sent 800 children from this one development, almost eliminating teen pregnancy, and they cooperated and drove the drug dealers out. Uh, in the 90s, we were working with a group uh, of, of uh, intermediary institutions, mediating structures. We went into a gang territory of five, where there are 53 gang murders in a five square block area in two years. Again, because of the, the, the leaders of these communities had the trust and confidence of the young people, we brought the warring factions into our office and negotiated a peace. And as a consequence, the, that area went from 53 gang deaths down to zero, and that peace lasted for 12 years. In not, need, another, neither one of these situations did university evaluators come into that community to ask, what is it that they are doing that we can learn from to evaluate them? Nor did foundation, liberal foundations, pour it in. And instead, the Annie Casey Foundation spent $100 million on a program that they designed for poor people, <coughs> parachuted into five cities with the goal of surrounding poor kids with professional service providers. Their own evaluation after five years revealed that the children who are part of their control group were worse off than the kids who received no attention from these grants. But nobody from these foundations ever get fired. <laughs> it's not a scandal. They go on and do the same thing. In other words, in, in, in the funding community, you can waste millions if it's well-managed by well-intentioned people. But you can't risk a dollar supporting a mediating institution. And so, and, and so then what, what is the conservative response to this? Well, Bill Bennett described the dilemma. He said, when liberals see poor people, they see a sea of victims, and conservatives see a sea of aliens. Conservatives, I think, reinforce sometimes the notion that they have the correct doctrine, but not the correct deeds. Dr. King said the highest form of maturity is the ability to be self-critical. With the exception of the Bradley Foundation and a very few others, conservatives tend to stand on the sidelines and be judgmental about what the people do. I think as Mike Gerson said, sometimes they confirm the stereotypes about themselves where they cling, 
the clinging wine glasses while bemoaning the irresponsible behavior of the help. <laughs> what I believe the conservative movement needs to do to answer your question is, and the reason that I have, I'm working with conservatives is because poor people need allies. People who are part of the poverty, industrial, race grievance industry have a proprietary interest that is hostile to the interests of the poor and therefore, no matter how well-intentioned they are, it's very difficult for them to support and initiatives by untutored people that may place them out of work. So they've got to weigh their economic interests against the interests of these mediating institutions. By contrast, conservatives have strategic interests that are compatible with the poor because they don't benefit from high taxes, they don't benefit from the dependency of people. If you own a business, you need someone who can show up to work on time responsibly. So therefore, there's a natural uh, relation, potential relationship. That's why when Paul Ryan called and said, Bob, this campaign is not addressing the needs of the poor. Can you help us? And we brought him together with 20 grassroots leaders in, in, in Cleveland. And some of them shared with them their, their efforts to help themselves. And as a consequence, Paul called each of the four that he highlighted in his speech. So he personalized it. And I think what uh, conservatives must do, in the words of Michael Joyce in 1996, he said, now we need to be honest about our shortcomings in political discourse. When we talk about the need to shrink the federal government simply because it costs too much, when we focus exclusively on balancing the budget, as critical as those undertakings are, we do begin to sound like crabby, small-souled bookkeepers. We play right into liberalism's character of us as heartless, uncaring conservatives. When we put on our green eye shades, it enables liberalism to put on the armor of righteousness, and that sets up a contest for public opinion that's difficult for us to win. So it seems to me that what the conservative movement has to do is begin to build bridges into those communities and not come, and, but, but what conservatives must overcome this penchant they have, and that is once they achieve power, they tend to sacrifice old friends to appease old enemies. <coughs> And, what the, and, and so therefore, I think conservatives will never accomplish what I have outlined here by practicing identity politics, too, if they can just recruit uh, a black who used to be a Democrat and who is now a professed conservative, or if I can just get the right Hispanic. It is not the race or sex of the ruler that determines winners and losers. It is the nature of the rules. And conservatives need to come to low-income people and offer to be an agent, to be like a venture capitalist to a social entrepreneur. The Joseph and the Pharaoh, as I point out in my book, Joseph did not represent a faith-based experience for Pharaoh. What Pharaoh did was impress with Joseph's secular consequence of his faith, not the faith itself. And this is the, these are the new kind of alliances we must have in America because conservatives have interests that are politically, economically, and morally compatible with the needs of low-income people. They've just got to overcome their elitism and recognize that poverty makes you frustrated, but it does not make you stupid. There is a book that you all should read by Richard Watts, who was on a panel, and it's called... Uh, fables of fortune, what rich people have that you don't want. If we are concerned about the debilitating effect of dependency and a sense of entitlement, this applies to rich people too. That their children are growing up detached from work, detached from personal responsibility, and the kind of uh, uh, patholo path pathological behavior that we're s witnessing on the part of low-income people is also true of, of the sons and daughters of the wealthy. So I believe that the Josephs of this world 
have much to contribute to this society, not only in reducing poverty, reducing the, but also reducing the moral and spiritual poverty of the wealthy who are locked in gilded ghettos of America. God bless you. Go to Q and A, and in just a second, we have a, a terrific audience here. Um, but I do, I, I do have to. I was on a, a radio program yesterday with Hugh Hewitt. Uh, I thought it was going to be a friendly uh, interview <laughs> with you, but as it turns out, I was uh, the point of uh, I was the brunt of some point he was trying to make. Uh, and the, the the interview was about this panel. Uh, and uh, he said that he and his, several of his friends received the invitation to this panel, and they, <laughs> and as he put it, the hair on the back of his neck rose uh, at yet another gathering of Washington intellectuals uh, speaking, as it turns out, on K Street here, right, or not too far from K Street, talking about civil society, uh, when in fact, um, you know, we have we're we're just locked in this in this little shell here in Washington, and we have no capacity to understand what real civil society uh, is all about. Uh, and well, you know, I tried to uh, explain. Why? Well, first of all, I explained to his uh, listeners that. Uh, you know, Hugh is, uh, used to be my boss at uh, the Office of Personnel Management, and that he's still mean as a snake. But uh, <laughs> a after, the, after the personal insult, I, I ventured various explanations. But he said, put the question, put that question, put that comment to this panel. So I put this comment uh, on his behalf to this panel. Uh, why, are, why are you elitists sitting here in Washington talking about civil society when, in fact, you have almost no connection to the real world? You know, is this just another Washington panel talking about the same old stuff? Bob, you were sort of getting at that in your comments. Yeah, 80% but... yeah, of my f closest friends are ex-something, ex-prostitutes, ex-drug addicts. Uh, and so, and the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise spends... Uh, all of its time and its resources working in these communities, helping people to develop within their own remedies to their own problems. So uh, if that qualifies me as being an, uh, an aloof elitist, I plead guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Eric. Well, I come from Minnesota. That's right. I, f I forgot to point that out. Hey, Harry, yes, I'm up. sorry. And I grew up in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, and my family were called rednecks. So. <laughs> Um, but I want to I want to go to a point Bob made. Uh, <clears throat> I, I agree with you about the problem of detached professional service delivery culture. You look at institutions in the Twin Cities <laughs> or anywhere, and even neighborhood groups, nonprofits have become detached from the life of places. Uh, the settlement house on the north side of Minneapolis, Phyllis Wheatley, um, used to have a rule: African American community that everyone lived, who worked there, lived in the neighborhood and had to get to know everybody in the neighborhood. Exactly. They didn't use any term service. It was not part of their vocabulary in the 30s, 20s and 30s. They talked about clubs and they saw everything they did as about the development of the leadership of the people in the community. So it was what I would call a mediating structure that was a center for power. And when I'm talking about power, and, and Gertrude Brown used to give a speech every spring about the, the challenges of the movement. And it had a tremendous intellectual life. I could go on and on about Phyllis Wheatley. My difference with Bob, just to draw some distinctions, and also with, with John McKnight, is that I don't think we can write off the professional system. I think in the tradition of Gene Baroni, Gino Baroni, they have to be transformed. We have to revive traditions of citizen professional rather than detached professional. And we've seen many cases. <laughs> of, Populism Collection has a lot of examples like that. We have, we have very powerful stories of professionals whose identities have changed so they no longer see themselves as fixing people. They'd like Bill Doherty, uh, working with African Americans, Native Americans, leading family social scientists, family therapists. He calls himself a citizen professional. Uh, and he's, his premise is that most of the energy, wisdom, and capacity to address problems comes from communities and from family networks. And 
And because of that transformation, we've seen all sorts of movements develop in communities because it basically involves getting out of the way and unlocking energies and then being a catalyst and bringing some resources but not thinking you can fix people. So I, th I think the challenge is how do, we, uh, how do we develop a politics that brings an, an organizing, democratizing perspective everywhere. And again, I, I believe Gina Baroni was a great, uh, great example of that tradition. Harry, let me just say, but there, again, there are strategic reasons that make it very difficult for many of the people. I have a master's degree from the University of Penn School of Social Work, so I'm part of that, at least by training. But if you have an, an institution like the foster care system that has 70, spends $72 billion a year, and you're running a home, and you're, you only get reimbursed for having children that are separate from homes or in adoption, you have no proprietary interest in placing those children. The more you keep the children, the more they deteriorate, the higher your reimbursement rate is. And, and so how do you, how do you democratize a, a corrupt relationship where the interests of children are hostile to the interests of the parents and of those children? Well, look, I, I would agree um, it's a big challenge. <laughs> And I don't well, that's think, not an answer. No, I'm, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> some stories. Tell me it's a big challenge. No, it's look, not I, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not denying that there's a problem. Yeah, don't make me come between you two. <laughs> <laughs> You'll go right over that. Jimmy. I'll handle it. <laughs> but I think they're strong, and I don't think it, the change is going to come from the system itself. It's going to come from people inside and outside the system who are trying to experiment with doing things different and have some cases to build on, and also building other centers of, of networks of support. Um, I mean, I, they're, they're good stories of that in the Twin Cities, but I, it's, it's like, a, it's, let me just get another, another story. I mean, our view of education is we have to put work at the center of education. Education has to become consequential for especially poor kids and kids of color, minority kids, um, has to be about who they're going to be in the world and what they're going to do. So a great story that can be learned from across the whole country is the Chicago High School of Agricultural Sciences, which has twice the success rate in academic scores of any other inner city school in Chicago. It's a working farm. Kids learn math and science by building things and making things. And it's a very good integration and a challenge to the vocational education approach. Um, now that, 88% 80, 80, of kids from the Chicago high school go to college. The inner city kids, 65% black and, and uh, Latino. It's because it's a different kind of education. <coughs> it, it doesn't make a distinction between work and learning. It says work experiences can be profoundly educational. That, that's a model. of, And everybody in that school, every teacher thinks of himself as a citizen teacher working with community people. Harry, that, let me just one quick yeah, response. Gotta, gotta, gotta Marva Collins with the Eastside Academy in Chicago demonstrated the same thing. Okay, Jaime Escalante in L.A. Uh, did the same thing, got all kinds of awards. Where are the Jaime Escalante Institutes? Why, where is it, why, why aren't we seeing 20 of them or 50 of them? Why aren't we seeing 30 or 40 East Side of Canada? Having a model of excellence that demonstrates that poor kids can learn in that environment is insufficient. You've got to change the rules of the game, and I think we're liberals and conservatives, if they're sincere, we really need to challenge them to say, change the reimbursement formula that places a greater emphasis on children being united in families. And, and these are, unless we are prepared to change the rules of the game, talking about effective examples that illustrate that children can be, learn is useless. Well, Anybody else way. want to get in on this before we go to the <laughs> Q&A? Yuval, you're going to reckon, you're going to tell us how yeah, we can just, have, uh, <laughs> preserve the professional systems while uh, encouraging uh, civic I, I, I Let me first plead guilty to Hugh Hewitt's criticism, uh, <laughs> being that I'm from Washington and can't tell you that I'm not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. And that, you know, I, you have to think about where you can add value. He and said very nice things about you, incidentally. He said well, you've been on the program a number of times. And he was, he wasn't but, nice to me either, though, so maybe that's... Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I, I would say this, I, I think you want allies everywhere, and you certainly want allies where there is power, um, as Harry suggested. And I, 
it's true. If I if I came across the, you know, the, the, Bob's joke is somewhat true. If I came across a problem and I would think, well, how can I add value here? What can I really do? Maybe I would go and write a column, and maybe that's ridiculous. But you also need some people to do that. Um, no, that's true. Yeah. No, and that's it, true. You, you, you have to have people doing their best where they are. And especially if you need a transformation of the rules, I think it's very important to have people in the places where rules are made thinking about what the point is. What is the end you're trying to achieve? What's the goal you're trying to serve? We have enormous resources uh, in the hands of the federal government, but we're dealing with a set of problems that do not amount to a lack of resources. Um, they, they often amount to an absence of opportunities, and I think even more frequently, they amount to a misunderstanding of the nature of the problem. And th there are ways in which, in which models of past successful social movements can help, but I think the, the sort of problems, the, the sorts of problems that the poor in America have to deal with are not fundamentally problems that require a transformation of the shape of our society. They require changes in the way people think about their own lives. Not just the poor, everybody else. As, as was suggested here, the, 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 the wealthy aren't in a great position to tell anybody much about work either. And nobody is. And that's the problem. Right. We need models. And we need people thinking about what kind of models need to be created. I think the solution would have less to do with changing power relationships in society and more to do with changing people's attitudes about what it is that a good life, a thriving life consists of. That is very hard to do. It is much easier as a political matter to change social institutions, though it's far from easy, don't get me wrong, than to change people. And the fact is, government, especially a distant government, will always have a terribly hard time coming in and helping people change themselves. So you have to ask yourself, how do people successfully change themselves? The answer is never going to be obvious. It's always going to consist of a very diverse set of, of practices and institutions that have grown from the bottom up. And you have to ask yourself, how can we help? Or at least, how can we not hurt? I would not suggest that the answer would be easy, but I think it's very important for people in Washington to be asking that question, because otherwise they're not just not doing enough good, they're doing active harm. They're using the resources of the American public to get in the way of people who are actually solving problems on the ground the very problems that we want to solve. So it seems to me it does matter that people here give some thought to these kinds of questions. Great. Let's go to the, our audience for some Q&A. We have, as I say, we have a, a number of figures in the audience who have been important in this debate. Uh, uh, Gerald Taylor, as, as uh, Harry pointed out, is a distinguished leader in the industrial areas foundation tradition. and. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Michael Baruti, who helped uh, establish this mediating structures argument uh, mm -hmm. for the, with the Reagan administration. Stanley Carlson Thies, who did the same with the George W. Bush administration. Uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb, of course, who's written a, just marvelous uh, uh, accounts of, uh, of the need to what she described as remoralizing, uh, the need to remoralize America. So um, anyway with this distinguished audience, I'm not going to ask Martin Wooster for the, to put the first question. I'm going to, <laughs> no, go ahead, Martin, that's, that's fine. We'll, uh... um, I'm Martin Wooster. I'm not distinguished. I'm just a guy in the suburbs. Do you live in Washington? That's the question. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Do you Hell, live in I was born in Washington. Oh, my God. Um, Speak directly. Yeah, very my close. question is this. Okay. Compassionate conservatism, as practiced by the Bush administration, wasn't very much of anything, was it? Yeah. I mean, it just fizzled out into conferences and not very much yeah. else. It is fair to say that compassionate conservatism was a failed policy. What can we learn from its failure? Good. <laughs> Good question. And incidentally, other conservatives have gone even farther, as you may know, and uh, Jonah Goldberg's book, Liberal Fascism, he cites compassionate conservatism as an example of fascist tendencies in the conservative movement. So this is actually something we need to, to discuss. Wh why is, com what, what happened there? What, what compassionate conservatism uh, was an attempt uh, to, to uh, institutionalize this civil society approach and things went wrong. What? what? I, I frankly, from, from my experience, um, it was hijacked. 
it became part of Karl Rove's uh, uh, campaign. Um, also, when we, we talked about, we never, those of us who were at, at the beginning of the we never once wanted government to fund faith-based organizations. It was never to be uh, an object of funding. What we talked about is government removing the barriers, stepping away. We are saying there should be tax credits so we empower individuals to receive uh, a choice. But it was never intended to be a big government giveaway program from the government giving money to faith-based organizations. We opposed it. And so it got hijacked and, and marginalized and became irrelevant and did a disservice to the whole neighborhood empowerment movement. Anybody else? Well, let me just say, I think it's... Um, yeah, you're part, you, were, you were there toward the yeah, end. Yeah, again, I'm part of the problem. Thank yes, you. Yes, you, yeah, uh, right. I, I wasn't really, but... Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that there was a... I think the compassion conservatism, as to the extent that it was more than a rhetorical device, saw itself as... Uh, in practice, existing to change the rules that prevented federal money from flowing to certain groups who were trying to address social problems. And uh, as Bob says, that's not the essence of the problem. And when you focus on money, and when you focus explicitly on faith-based groups, rather than, uh, rather than ask the question, what's working, um, right. I, you, you do run into trouble. You, you, <coughs> you, you create a different, a different form of the problem of government deciding how to spend money by the wrong criteria. Right. Uh, I think compassionate conservatism did do some good. I think even the faith-based initiative did do some good, but it certainly didn't live up to its ambitions. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think part of that is that it, it necessarily understood itself as thinking about how to reallocate federal resources. Exactly. It's actually difficult for someone at the upper levels of the federal government to not think that way because you have such enormous resources at your command, you see that in these instances, a lot of the time they're being used in actively harmful ways, and you try to think, how can we at least mitigate that problem? Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think at the end of the day, the criteria were not the right ones, but it's not self-evident how the federal government can use the levers that it has to help in a real way. If you were to go to um, 20 cities controlled by conservative Republican governors and go to 20 controlled by liberal Democratic governors and try to find out what is the difference in their funding patterns or who they rely on for advice in terms of delivery of so social services, they would be indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. Is because, we, unfortunately, we, Republicans <coughs> have a difficult time governing these policy changes into practice. They have to rely upon the same liberal professionals who are in those bureaucracies, and they know it. So they just wait for, this, for, for, the, for the politicians to arrive just to roll out the same remedies with the consequence that it doesn't matter who is in public office as long as we don't understand that it's not enough that that the, that the task doesn't end getting elected to office is how do you begin to administer these policy changes into practice? Yes. What? Yeah, Mr. Spelter, please, down, down front. Nope. Somebody better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I came in here depressed, and now I'm distraught. <laughs> uh, at the Kennedy School, where we were teaching economics, we used to say, get the incentives right, which is essentially what uh, Mr. Wood was saying. The, what I, I don't see a, a solution to this problem. The incentives are all wrong. The example you use uh, for foster homes, it's clear the incentive is to do bad things. The people who create the incentives have an incentive to create the incentives that exist. If that's true, how can you ever make progress in this area? Everybody has the wrong incentives, including the people who make the rules. So 
you know, I mean, it, it, this lovely conversation, but um, why, in other words, okay. why should what I is, not what is the, I mean, what is the solution? I think there is, there is, I think, a potential consensus around how do we reduce violence. There's no argument that violence should be reduced. I don't think there's an argument that children need to be raised in two-parent households that are trapped. So you have a, a church in, in Somerset, New Jersey, a black church, that took on this challenge. They had border babies who were languishing, drug-addicted parents. This was a problem, an economic and a social problem. The church stepped up, took these babies, put them in the home, and, and as a consequence, they have now 280 children who are in adoptive homes. Because the government is running out of money, they are now forced to look at alternative and more efficient ways to deliver services. So now we have an opportunity, because of the budget shortfalls, for innovation that ends up solving the problem to be enacted. That's my, and there are other examples from other areas where if, as long as some intervention has the consequence of lowering costs, reducing government, then we'll, we'll get an audience. So we'll get an audience now that we would not have gotten this, when there was plenty of money to spend. So just, that's the incentive. I think the issue I'm is feeling power. better. I, I want to mm -hmm. argue. I'm <laughs> feeling better. I'm what good. you're saying is that starving the beast works. Well, yes, sir. There's another approach. I mean, Baroni represented another <laughs> approach to policy change. So the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act uh, it required banks to publicize where they were loaning. And it wasn't government regulating the problem of bank loans. It was giving people information which they were able to use to target redlining policies. Yeah, and look where the housing situation got. <laughs> well, Baroni w was doing this in the late 70s. But it was an enormous prod, as was uh, the, the Community Development Block Grant Program that he helped initiate, as was the Co-op Loan Bank. He, basically, Baroni's approach was small initiatives that would be catalysts and resources for people to self-organize. And that was remarkably successful. It had some kinship with the Berger Newhouse mediating structures approach. But it was more conscious about actually people becoming powerful agents and building powerful centers in the life of communities. I think we need that kind of policy again. I think there are a lot of examples. Another example, in the Clinton administration that, uh, that Gore didn't pick up on in the in the 2000 election was the fact that there was some shift towards civic environmentalism that Bill Schomburg was a champion of, in which you shifted from a regulatory approach to environmental change <laughs> to the government setting certain contexts and providing community resources to figure out how to meet broad environmental goals. Now that was not saying what government telling industries and local businesses what to do. It was creating a context in which people develop the capacities to figure it out. I think those kinds of policies are what we need to identify. You've all just just you've written eloquently about the budget problem. What what do you say about this about this proposition, which is that granted the incentives have always been bad in the past. Are we in fact running up against the final limits of what we can afford? In other words, we have we have constructed a massive and expensive service delivery program. Uh, which, in spite of Harry's best efforts, and, and he's tried for a long time, and I'm not, I'm not just, you know, poking him, but, you know, in spite of Harry's best efforts, they, you know, the professional networks continue, right, right. to be expensive and detached. <coughs> uh, are, we in are, are we finally bumping up against the limits of what we can do, and are we forced, right, e right. even if the incentives are, are not That's there, right. we're forced to begin to look at that church in Somerset, New Jersey, pastored by uh, Buster Sorry's, you know, for alternatives. Yeah. Well, I I hope so. I, I'm not sh I'm not as sh as confident that that's the case. Um, I I think that the I think that the the kind of starve the beast idea has a certain intuitive appeal, but we we have an awful lot of capital to burn in this country, and, and I I don't know that you get to a point where you simply don't have enough money to keep making mistakes anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, it's true, especially at the state level and, and to, to a lesser but serious degree at the local level, that governments are running out of money um, and they do have to reconsider some of what they're doing. They have a fairly strong case to make that social policy is not the reason they're running out of money, but nonetheless, they have to find savings where they can find them. 
Um, and, and so maybe those, those policymakers at those levels that are inclined to these ways of thinking can propose to the public ways of addressing these problems that happen to be less expensive at the same time that they are also actually better solutions. Um, I, I hope that's right, but I, I would say if you think about the, the kinds of, if you think about the fiscal questions that confront governors right now uh, and mayors of large cities, um, they need to cut spending and they also need to show voters that they're not just slashing things. And I think that that means they're going to end up cutting in other places than in social policy. And, you know, they still have enough capital to burn that they're not at the point where a simple lack of resources is going to force them to fundamentally reconsider how they think about the poor. Gerald has a question. But I hope they do. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Taylor, please. Just and again, thank you, for, thank you for coming. It's an honor to have you here. A couple of thought uh, question. I'm always struck that the, the conservative argument about civil society never includes a discussion about the private sector's role in undermining civil society. The populist revolt in the 1800s was a civil society revolt against the change in the economy that was taking place <coughs> in the late 1800s. Then you, I'll give you a second example and then I'll get your response. The building of highway systems in the United States was not simply a federal government decision. It was a private sector construction industry role in that process of building highways which destroyed thousands and thousands of houses and homes and institutions in civil society of minority families and working class ethnic families. In the present environment, the corporate sector participates through the government's role in privatizing, for example, to the prison industry. I met with a guy that has the CCA, and he said, what do you do? We said, we organize people to get kids to, you know, organ we organize. He said, well, I hope you all are unsuccessful. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, why? He said, well, you know, our prison industry is based upon failing children in schools. Exactly. So it is in our interest that children fail in education because we base our bed distri distribution on the failure rate of kids in public schools. That's the private sector, not the government. I agree with you. And the last point is that the private sector focuses on the disruption of civil society on a constant and continuous basis. Advertisers are constantly trying to break up family units into individual consumption focuses that they market to. So I want to hear, when is the conservative argument going to deal with the role of the private sector and the destruction of civil society? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, let me adamantly agree with that. I, I, I would actually go further. I, I think that the, the basic <laughs> character of the market economy, of which I'm a defender and a champion, is not conducive to the kind of citizen that is required in a free society. It has to be balanced off by another set of ideals, by other forming institutions that create the kind of citizen that is capable of the level of responsibility that our kind of society requires and that the market itself requires. Democratic capitalism relies on a sort of citizen that it does not create uh, and therefore relies on social capital that has to come from somewhere else and especially in our sort of society, from civil society, which means that it is not the case that the interests of, of the private sector in our kind of economy and the interests of civil society, but the interests of society as a whole, of uh, the moral future of our country, uh, are always aligned. They are in tension. Uh, I think that tension is actually a healthy tension in many respects, that they balance each other off. I also think they need each other. It's true that the market economy can't exist without a certain kind of citizen, but it's also very hard for a, uh, for a moral society to exist without some wealth, rather a lot of it. And the market economy does create a lot of it. So we need economic growth. The poor need it more than anybody. But we also need institutions that form citizens that are able to resist the worst inclinations of the market economy. We need both, and right now we don't have both, and that's a serious problem. Let me just add, I think I've always said in the conservative, it's a false dichotomy to argue government versus private. The issue is effective versus ineffective. You have some government programs in the 60s when Bobby Kennedy went in Appalachia, uh, children were dying of uh, uh, Kwashiko, or is that the name of it, where your stomach was big and head is red, <coughs> and old people in Miami were dying with no food in their stomachs. 
government intervene, and we don't have that problem today. By contrast, you've got some private sector people who, who are doing some things that are equally as, as, as egregious as the public. So what the standard, it seems to me, ought to be whether an activity is life-affirming or if it, is it is not. And that's the standard that should drive what gets supported, not private versus government. That's a false e uh, dichotomy. I, I would agree, with, except I would also say uh, the question is how can businesses develop civic roots. I mean, we've lost businesses which feel accountable. There's a very fine um, book called The Tumbleweed Society, which talks about the loss of any sense of responsibility on the part of employers to the communities and the employees which they employ. And there's a, there's a bifurcation of culture here. It's a, it's a very interesting study. Workers continue to want to do a good job. They have a strong work ethic. Um, they, they feel that they, they owe it to the places they work. Employers basically have come to see, and this crosses uh, the private sector and higher education and other institutions as well, have come to see workers as expendable units in an abstract economy. It's exactly what John Paul worried about, the kind of culture of efficiency yeah. which radically depersonalizes. And we have to take that on. And that means... Um, a different understanding <laughs> of business. In, in the Twin Cities, I've done interviews with the major business leaders who also we've lost the tradition of businesses which see themselves as part, like the Dayton department store, which see themselves as part of the life of the, of the Twin Cities, civic businesses. Sure. <laughs> it, 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 it is very important well, to remember, though, that, yeah. that businesses respond to incentives exactly. like everybody else. And it's not the case that they're inherently evil because they're involved in the private economy or that they're inherently evil at all. Business does a lot of good, too. And it, I, I would not say that we've entirely lost the ethic of no, businesses of caring of about their place right. in society and their workers. There's an enormous amount of that happening. I think there are ways for government to be helpful in organizing incentives in that direction. I also think there are ways for consumers to be helpful, since at the end of the day, the incentives businesses respond to are consumer pressures. Uh, so, you know, they're not the essence of the problem either, but there has to be a sense of the end we're going for, of the sort of society that we believe we ought to have. Tremendous role of higher education, which has lost the sense of teaching business men to think of themselves as citizens. Basically, well, that's, let's, that's largely a superior curriculum. And, and before before we, one, I'm sorry. Uh, can I was I just going to say one, one thing, and then I'll let you ask your question. That'll be the last question. It won't question. be a question. Um, <laughs> it won't be a question. Good. If somebody has a question, you better. No, no, I, no, just, no. I just wanted to say in, in response to uh, Mr. Taylor and in, in backing up what Bob and, and Yuval were saying, you know, no one was more eloquent in the, in the criticism of the atomizing and destructive effects of, of unfettered capitalism than Robert Nisbet, right, right. in the quest for that's community, right. who is, of course, uh, you know the, the uh, you know the sort of the leading theorist of this of this point, and there are conservatives today who make exactly that point. You know, the the folks gathered around a website called Front Porch Republic uh, have a strong tradition of of uh, the defense of of localism against uh, corporate you know corporate interests uh, overbearing corporations as well as overbearing central government. So there are I mean, but that's just to. To reassure you that there are a few. <laughs> well, <laughs> somebody has to, you know, we, we, we distribute the work. To, <laughs> yeah, to, Mr. Stokes. to add a touch of gloom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we need more gloom. One of the, uh, the uh, Republican Party absolutely blew it on the issue of bankers, excessive compensation, exactly. uh, that whole... Uh, range of things that they they took any criticism to be an interference with the market. Nobody ever understood a market to produce those kind of results. Where what the head of Goldman Sachs said, "I do God's work." Uh, well, uh, but you've got a much bigger problem than that. The pressures on the private sector have changed very substantially. Uh, when you see a merger, for instance, of two banks, one of the things to get permission you have to do is promise to continue. The, the exiting bank has to promise to continue giving money to the United Fund in the city it was leaving just to bribe the politicians. You have a problem. The problem is globalization. It's not that suddenly corporate people have turned evil and want to exploit their workers more than they ever did. The problem is that they're now competing, especially unskilled workers, 
with another billion people who have entered the workforce. Now, the solution to that is rather simple. Protectionism. Raise tariffs, redistribute wealth that way. You've got another solution. The fact of the matter is we have a monetary policy which robs from savers to give to people who borrow by setting interest rates at zero. Unless the Republicans are prepared to come to grips with the fact that they don't want banks to get zero interest money to use to lend at a profit, they're never going to have anything to say about these basic problems. And I don't see uh, any hope outside of the offices of the Weekly Standard that uh, any of this is going to happen. So on that cheery note. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we let our panelists uh, Concluding thoughts. We have two minutes. Just brief concluding thoughts. Final final reactions to this uh, this discussion. Starting well, let me just Bob say, I I really believe that in terms of the the 2,500 grassroots Joseph organizations that we represent across the country in 39 states, this is a very promising time because we can demonstrate through our actions that it is quite possible to expand help for the poor while reducing the cost of programs and therefore help more people. We have demonstrated it at our violence free zone program. We can come into the worst schools and, and reduce violence 25% in the first three months. And, and so I think in a, in a competitive environment like that, I think that uh, innovation thrives. So uh, I, I said, thank God for our, our budget shortfalls. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy, do you want to? Yeah. And, and I, let, let me say, I thought your observation about the power of the personal is very important because I, it goes to this argument we were having about the character of professionalism and professional yeah. structures. The whole point, of course, of, of, uh, of you know, professional organizations is the power of the impersonal. And uh, that, that, I think, gets very much to the root of this debate between Woodson and Boyd about, about uh, the, our ability at some point to uh, infiltrate professional structures with civic values. But anyway, uh, please go ahead. And well, I think it, a critical component to this whole discussion is understanding the human condition and that we have very different views in this country and in the world about what the human condition is. Um, and that's, it's such a fundamental uh, understanding. And our country um, was founded on Judeo-Christian principles um, that acknowledge that we, uh, we do have a serious human condition. Um, therefore, you can't have professional systems which are perfect, nor can you have uh, you know, a market economy, which is going to be perfect. So recognizing that perfection is not attainable is a starting point, but certainly it does not mean that we cannot improve in our society. We have fixed many problems uh, in this great country, um, yet we're never going to uh, become perfect. Um, my dad was the ultimate optimist, and I distinctly remember uh, an argument with him in elitist Vale, Colorado. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, you can tell Hugh that I, I am part of the problem. I guess I am an elitist. I live in Northwest D.C. Um, but Dad, I, I said, Dad, do you really think that humans are perfectible um, and that we can achieve, uh, you know, that level? And he didn't, per he didn't answer the question as clearly as I wanted to. It, we, it actually turned into one of the, the more serious arguments I had with my dad. <laughs> Um, but he really believed that we could be increasing. And I don't understand how the human condition is as it ever is, yet there can be progress up and down. Um, and the thing that strikes me most is that we've got to ask the question, what works? Um, right. We've got to think about incentives. Um, and, and it comes down to so many things um, that have been talked about. Monetary policy is so critical, and we don't understand our monetary policy and the global impact that it has uh, with the, the dollar as the default uh, currency, um, with, which is effectively a fiat dollar. Um, and, you know, that, that has all kinds of impacts that my friend John Mueller in the back knows much better than I do. Um, but 
the other thing that I come back to, and I'll, I'll close on this, I, I have hope in part because of the success we've had in broaching incentives in education. I'm on the board of a charter school here in DC called Hope Community Charter School. Um, it is not a perfect school. I deal with all kinds of stuff. Uh, when upset parents want to call, talk to someone on the board, they, they call me. And, uh, but the great thing is that our school leaders have the opportunity to fire bad teachers and attract and figure out how we can attract good teachers. And we've got to be creating, uh, we're not going to get rid of the education system, but we certainly can improve it. And I would say education is one of the areas, the dynamic areas that has got to be focused on. And we need to align uh, incentives along the lines of what works. So I, I like the example, but how do you get that throughout the system? Um, and I would say charter schools is uh, one of the ways. Is it a perfect way? No, um, but it's one of the ways. And we have to relentlessly pursue those things um, that improve systems, which we know we're not going to get rid of. Um, but we also need to grow the economy. Uh, and that's, I think that would do a lot. I, so <laughs> I have hope, but it's different than incentive structures and systems and blueprints and policies, all of which play a role, but my hope is in the people. I'm a, an American Southern populist who believes the real talent and the capacity in the future of America comes when the people become uh, sober and serious and constructive. I saw that in the freedom movement. I think there are many stirrings of that today, just two examples on a large scale. One is it seems to me different than either protectionism or banking. Uh, there is a serious movement to reclaim local economic life. You could even see it in this last weekend, all of the shop local. Now that's a movement. That's about local economic institution. That's a people's movement. It has policy implications and dimension, controlling capital flow, but it's a people's movement. And I must say, just to note, Diane Sawyer is a big champion of this on ABC News. Um, and secondly, there is definitely a movement within the professional world, which is anchored, after all, in colleges, and is feels in profound crisis. I mean, I've done hundreds of interviews with professionals of all kinds. People feel in crisis because what they, their model isn't working. It's dehumanized. It's abstract. There are all sorts of examples of ferment, some of which we talked about in our populism collection, that is about the, re, re, the transformation of colleges and the professional systems connected to them so that they become part of the life of places, again, in the old land grant tradition, <laughs> not apart from places or simply partners with places. And I think we, we're seeing a populist stirring in the middle of, of the educational and professional world as well as in the economic world. You've all last word. Well, I, I guess I'm incapable of gloom about America. Um, and I, I think that the, the, one of the things that stands out about this country should make us especially hopeful about it now, which is its incredible capacity for unexpected renewal, mm -hmm. uh, precisely in the face of gloom. We've, we've faced a lot of problems in the past that have seemed for serious reasons to be insurmountable and that have been surmounted by a kind of revival from the bottom, often a religious revival, a cultural revival. That's not something you can call up from Washington or from anywhere else. But our history does give us reason to be hopeful. Hopeful doesn't mean optimistic. Optimistic means you expect things to get better. Hopeful means you believe they can. And if you believe they can, you want to do something about it. Uh, I think hope should drive us to act, to try to fix the rules, to try to do what we can to stop doing harm, to try to do what we can to use the resources that we have access to, uh, to improve the situation and fix the problem. I have enormous hope. Um, I, I don't see how you can live in America and not have enormous hope right. about its prospects. But that in itself doesn't solve the problem. And so we need conversations like this to think about how to solve the problem. Great. Okay. Let's uh, give our panel a, a hand. That was fun. Ah. Thank you. Okay, Jimmy. Very good to meet you. Very good to meet you. So is this the title of the...